Welcome again, saints. It's your dearest servant, Brother Pastor Brian Dale of the St. Mark Baptist Church, located at 2024 Clearview Street, right here in the city of Waterloo, Iowa. Before I say anything else, let me pray for us. Uh, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you. Oh, Lord, that we just have one more day in order to not live for ourselves, Lord, but live for you, Lord, another day. Uh, Lord, to just proclaim your goodness while we have yet breath in our body. Lord, it's another day, Lord, to gather as believers uh, electronically, Lord, over whatever medium um, this uh, Sunday school lesson is heard on. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for the platforms, uh, Lord, that you've allowed uh, St. Mark to be on in order to teach your word, uh, Lord, wherever this word will go out. Lord, give us our eyes to see today, ears to hear, but also, Lord, so our spirits can be fertile soil, Lord, for the planting of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, saints, we begin our unit three today, and this unit is called uh, Women Speak Out. Again, women uh, speak out. And today, uh, is lesson nine, January 31st, 2021. Again, unit three to call the women. And the title is Women Speak Out of Our Lesson. But what I want to do uh, is just give you kind of a big picture overview of our first two units because, again, I'm not going to go lesson by lesson, certain. I'm just going to give you really huge ideas, uh, obviously. But as I said, it is important to do this because each of these are not, each of these lessons each build upon another and they're not isolated as islands among themselves. These lessons are thematic and what these lessons are is each of these themes build upon the one before it. And what we talked about previously uh, was our corporate calling. Again, our corporate calling because a lot of times in ministry, we get so caught up in what I called before the cult of personalities and we got these you know, these bodies, these ministries built around some church leader or some personality of a church leader. And some, and, and oftentimes Christ gets lost in that because we're so focused on the message. And are we so focused on the man or the woman that we're not focused on the message? And, and I know that. You know how I know that? I know that because let pastor or prophet or evangelist or teacher, let the, the church head leave town and see how many people still show up to hear the word of God. So if pastor leaves and you don't show up, what are you really going for? Yeah, I said it. So again, a lot of times we build upon, the, we build these bodies and personality and on these individual personalities when it should be our corporate calling that, that everything flows from. And, and we challenged you, or I challenged you um, to understand what our mission as the church really is. Now we moved on down to Jesus and his calls to ministry in unit two. And what we then dug into, we went from corporate calling as a body. We talked about these different gifts in the body. Then we moved on to the individual calling, right? And what we talked about in the uh, Jesus and his calls to ministry, one lesson that we really zeroed in on from that part was called the ultimate fish story. And I challenged you at that time, okay, now we've understood the corporate calling in, sec in unit one. We went on to individual calling in unit number two. Then we drilled down to individual gifting. So we talked about Peter and we talked about how Jesus called Simon and Andrew and he, he called them. Uh, well, they he performed this miracle and their nets were full of fish and in the Boats were weighed down so much that they were sinking, and they just dropped their nets and they followed Jesus. And it was interesting that the miracle Jesus performed uh, for those fishermen had to do with fish. It's interesting that the miracle that Jesus performed for the, the family of Lazarus, that who had died, had to do with death. He uh, uh, said, Lazarus, come forth. You know, Lazarus came out to me, raised the dead. So it's, Jesus spoke to individual and individual and people groups based on uh, their need. And what we found out in unit two, when we talked, when we talked about uh, Jesus and his calls to ministry, is we, we talked about and we used this phrase, and I use this saying, and I asked you this question, are you trying to fish with someone else's net? And we drilled down and we just dug into talking about uh, giftings and we talked about your gifting. And I, I, I challenge you not to be a clone of some other church leader or somebody else in a fellowship with the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you pray. And any of those other things I used as an example, um, 
our, our, our dear brother of ours uh, and the chairman of our trustee board, Brother Will Arthur Gary, and, you know, for years and years, you know, our, our deacons, they, a lot of times they can, they can pray in a certain way, if you know what I mean, and certainly a lot of those prayers are, are sincere. And I, I don't, when Brother Will, uh, when, when Brother Will got up to pray, uh, Brother Will Arthur uh, Gary got up to pray, it was just like a totally different model of prayer. And it was like, it, it wasn't like Brother Will was like calling on the Lord so much. Our Father and our God, the Father of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Not so much that as he was talking to the Lord on a personal level. And I, I have to say that it is probably one of the most powerful devotional prayers. It wasn't lengthy or anything like that. It wasn't singing nothing like that. It was just powerful. And Brother Will Arthur wasn't trying to fish with someone else's net. He was being who the Lord called him to be, and it just tore the place up. Now, when people running around, you know, doing all this stuff, wasn't nothing like that. It was just a really powerful moment that set the atmosphere, uh, certainly for the worship afterwards. So the point is, you can't be those people that came before you, and especially for church leaders and, and, and uh, whoever you are, auxiliary leaders, you have to find out who God called you to be. Because I told you, remember I said to you, I said, asking God, God, what do you want me to do? That's not the correct question. The correct question is always, God, who did you create me to be? Once I understand who he created me to be, I will then have further direction through the Holy Spirit of what I'm supposed to do. If you want to know what you're supposed to do before you are fully convinced in your own spirit who he called you to be, you old folks used to call that putting the cart before the horse, if you will. And we also talked about standing in the gap or intercessory prayer because that is also uh, a ministry and how we are to stand in the gap. And one thing that your dear servant warned you about uh, before we transition to a call to women one thing I warned you about with standing in the gap is be careful letting people put oil on you. Who puts oil on you? We talked about the seven sons of Sceva, uh, letting folks lay hands on you, let folks pray for you. You got to be careful who you let stand in the gap for you. And we all, I also challenged the, the self-righteous uh, who make comments about lost people or even our brothers and sisters who happen to be struggling in their faith at times to understand that somebody stood in the gap for you when you were struggling, whether you knew it or not. Hallelujah. So we move on uh, to unit three, the call to women. The call of women. And I, before we get started here, uh, lesson nine, again, January 31st, 2021, I, I want to, to, to say what a travesty uh, this is, is that 2,000 years after uh, Jesus, or about 2,000 years after the time of Jesus' earthly ministry, and certainly hundreds of years since we've been in this country, and certainly um, the last 100 years or decade, or decade, 10 decades, 10, 11 decades or so, that we even have to have this uh, conversation, but it's important uh, to have this conversation, and I before I... Uh, uh, get on down to our devotional reading and those types of things, I want to tell you that uh, I, your dear servant, have never pulled punches with you. Uh, I have been transparent before you. So as we go through this lesson, I want you always and always be prayed up. But especially through this lesson, especially for our sisters and, and our brothers, because I'm going in on y'all too. And I'm going in on our brothers uh, who are confused about this topic as well. I want you to always be in prayer and searching the scriptures to see if what I say here is of God or not. And if it is not, please get in touch with me and say, Brother brother, uh, brother Dale, Brian, whatever you want to call me, say, man, this is what God's word says, but this is what you say. But I want to tell you this. Don't go looking for one scripture to try to dis or make mockery of what is going to be taught here because it, our, our sisters in ministry, this is a serious subject uh, that needs to be taught and it needs to be divided from first wave and second wave feminism and all this other garbage that has, that has creeped into the church because the world is influencing the church instead of the church influencing the world. Amen. So I want to just tell you that I have been direct with you. I will continue to be direct with you, whatever the cost, uh, according to God's word. Second, you've never heard me say I think or I feel. So don't say, let the devil 
tell you, well, that's what he thinks and that's what he feels. You can rewind, go on YouTube, you can go Facebook, whatever. You've never heard your dear servant, especially here on this platform, on this broadcast, you've never heard me say I think or I feel. Because what I think or what I feel, according to God's word, is irrelevant. Because what I think or and what I felt had me lost in a world of sin. And it was God's word that brought me unto the marvelous light. Amen. So we go forward with this. Key verse, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And as the lesson aims to say, as a result of experiencing this lesson, you should be able to do these things. Examine how God called and empowered women to proclaim his message. Affirm the contributions of godly women to the church's mission. Advocate for greater recognition of God called women in the church. Called becomes an important word because I want to challenge all of us with this. Called to do what? Called to do what? Before also I continue on, there's uh, something that needs to be said as well. As we get into Women Speak Out and we get into these, these series of lessons, um, it is, I, I want you to understand that there are um, people, whether they're men or women, who claim that God called them to do this or that, that God has not called at all. And we look in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah uh, was, was crying out and he said, you said God told you to run and I have not told you to run. So there are people out there running races, if you will, that God never called to run certain races. And really, we, we try to break this down to gender, but it's really not a gender issue. What it is, is it's a spirit issue. Remember, the Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the rulers of the darkness, against uh, dominions, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, and the devil has made this a flesh and blood battle between men and women in the church, and that's not what it is at all. So all I'm saying there is there are people that are men, that say God has called them to do this and that, that God has not called. And there are women that say God has called them to do this and that, and they are not called. Now let's deal with the letter called. Again, called to do what? We use the word called as if it's pejorative to preaching, as if it's pejorative to pastoring, if it's just, if it's, as if it is pejorative to uh, being some sort of leader in the church, whatever you hold that to be. I would submit to you that all of us are leaders in God's kingdom to someone. So when you call, when you talk about being called, called to do what has to be the question. Again, remember, I said to you, Lord, who did you call me to be? Once I understand who he called me to be and I'm discipled and sanctification happens through the process of time and the spirit, what I should be doing becomes apparent. And the introduction. Many Americans are unfamiliar with the enormous impact of black women upon the civil rights movement. Their impact was vitally important to the success and the sustainability of the movement that reshaped America. Ali Ding Arster writes about these contributions of black women in USA Today article titled, The Unsung Heroes of the Civil Rights Movement or Black Women You Never Heard Of, Published February 16, 2018, she states, The courage of black female activists in confronting multiple forms of oppression influenced other protest movement, including second wave uh, feminism. Not, not that uh, this writer nor your dear servant uh, is, is saying second wave feminism has a place in the body of Christ. And we're going to learn about that just a few lessons from now. First wave feminism, second wave feminism, and how the se that secular mindset creeped into the church and really spread poison in the church. 
uh, in a way that God did not uh, certainly intend. The fight of gay rights and the, the protests against the Vietnam War, not that we are condoning that as well. And I want to make that clear. I, a preacher, I am not condoning that as well. Coretta Scott King, a leader in her own right, used her talent as a singer to raise awareness and funds for her husband's movement and to advocate for human rights broadly. She was an earlier, she was an earlier critic of the Vietnam War than her husband and persuaded him uh, to speak out against it. King was the face of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, one of the most prominent African-American civil rights organizations of the time. And just so you know, historically, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Coretta Scott King, uh, yeah, she did influence him. But his, uh, Dr. King's speaking out again to do with him trying to hold on to the movement because by 19, late 1967, early 1968, and we know, and I'm just off script here, but we know he was assassinated in April 1968 in uh, Memphis. Uh, what, what you have to understand at that time, there was radical uh, Black Panthers. There was just SNCC, Student Violent Coordinate Committee. Around that time, you start hearing the term that uh, Black power, uh, Black Muslims were getting radical, the Panther. All of these things were going down Music was getting more radical, and our young people that were born in the 40s started to take the leadership where King, Dr. King and his contemporaries are born in the 20s. And they started to uh, take uh, skin to the movement and become more radicalized. So Dr. King, uh, part of his speaking out against the Vietnam War was absolutely uh, his wife uh, encouraged him, but it also had to do what well, Dr. King didn't want to be uh, seen as some kind of hypocrite as well, because as he said, how could he speak against the evils of what was going on in America when those same Americans that this evil or black folks were sent to fight in the Vietnam War and couldn't even come home and have money to fight a uh, to, to buy a decent house or live in a decent neighborhood. So I pointed that out to understand that there were many facets of why Dr. King spoke out on uh, the Vietnam War. And one of the biggest was he was trying to hold on to a movement that was changing right in front of his eyes and was under sustained pressure right before his death by younger, more militant movements. Amen. I just wanted to share that with you. But it was the political savvy of the lifelong uh, activist Ella Baker, viewed by some as the most influential woman in the civil rights movement that birthed the organization and set its agenda, writes Barbara Ransby in Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement. Baker also had pivotal roles in the National Association of Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP, and, the, and SNCC, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating uh, Committee. Women like Ella Baker and the behind-the-scenes uh, work of Credit Scott King often go un unacknowledged in the moment, but let us uh, but let us be purposeful in ensuring that they are they are never ever unnoticed. And a lot of times that is what it comes down to uh, in the house of God is people wanting to be noticed. Um, and I'm, I'm not being critical of the introduction, but what I am saying. If you are doing what you are doing in the house of God, uh, sisters or brothers, uh, to be noticed, you are doing it for the, absolutely the wrong reasons. Remember, yes, God will exalt you in due time. The scripture does say that. But the Bible also says, do your alms or do your work or what God has sent you to do in private or your prayers in private, and God is going to reward you openly. And a lot of times, even in our social media culture, people say things not because they necessarily believe them or not necessarily because they can biblically back them up. It's because they want likes. Amen. So the biblical context, Anna is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew name Hannah, meaning grace or divine favor. The content of Anna's prophecy concerning the birth of Jesus had similarities to uh, Hannah's song at the birth of her son Samuel. Translators, translators differ in their calculations of their age. I'm going to skip that because, yeah, I don't want to enter confusion is about what this theologian says and what that theologian says. Yeah, I, that's irrelevant. What does God's word says? It says there was 84. She says she was 84 years old. It says it in English, and that's what we need to run with, you see. 
The pouring out of God's spirit on men and women of all ages at Pentecost is a fulfillment of God's promise in Joel 2, 28, 29, a response to Israel's repentance and renewed relationship with God. Women were included in receiving and testifying to the power of God's presence as revealed in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and manifested in the church. The power and movement of the Holy Ghost is evident throughout the Bible from the very beginning. The Holy Spirit moved on individuals, giving them skills in craftsmanship, wisdom in leadership, and strength in battles. The presence of the Holy Spirit was so powerful that King David prayed for God not to take the Holy Spirit from him. Psalms 51. It is this same Holy Spirit that guided prophets and then, after 400 years of silence, led the prophet Anna, led the prophet Anna and was released into all the world uh, to, uh, to lead souls to salvation in Jesus Christ. And there was one, and this is the uh, analysis of the biblical text. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribes of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score, or four score and four years old, which departed not from the temple, but God served with fasting and prayers day and night. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Now that we are there and the piece has been cracked open, we need to deal with three things in specific as we go through these lessons. The first thing that we want to deal with today is to, in order to subjugate our sisters in ministry, Anna certainly wasn't suppressed anyway. Um, in this way that we, in our holy, righteous selves, trying to be even more righteous than Jesus, Jesus didn't even suppress women in the way that we try to suppress women in the church. And here is the scripture that is used to suppress women. And what's interesting is this scripture is just often used intermittently or when it's convenient. I suffer, and this is Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, around verse 33, I believe it is. And I suffer not a woman to speak in the church, but to be in silence and learn at home with her husband. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians. So that is one of the script, that is the main scripture that I have found anyway that is used to push an unbiblical doctrine of women shouldn't speak in the church. Now, I understand that that is largely, uh, our sisters do speak in fellowships, but I, I bring that up today, not that many of the churches that we uh, gather with and associate with, certainly our church I pastor, that we tell women just to hush their mouth in the church. Not that we tell them that, but it, when it comes to them speaking and preaching, then we want to intermittently use that scripture. First, I got to say this to our brothers, and I got to go in on you biblically. I want to challenge you on this wise just really shortly because we've got a lot to get to and I don't have long to get to it. For those of you, especially you preachers and pastors and church leaders who use that, you use that to shut our sisters down when that same Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I want you to read the whole chapter, just three chapters earlier, Paul was not... Paul was, te Paul was talking about women prophesying and praying in the church. And what's interesting is he didn't rebuke them for doing it. He was telling them how to do it. So Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, was encouraging, uh, well, teaching women anyway, to, pro to, to prophesy and pray in church. But uh, these, And then three chapters later, all of a sudden, Paul is telling women to remain silent in the church and say nothing. Was Paul a schizophrenic? Was Paul, did he forget what he says? No. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul was dealing with a specific issue with some out of order people. That is what happens. That is the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And it didn't only mean, if you read the biblical, if you read, see the wider uh, view of the Bible, I'm not trying to get worked up here, but I get excited about confronting false doctrine, you see. When, when we read it, should any person in the church that is out of order continue to speak? The answer is absolutely not. And I know preachers, and I, I have myself, I've shut people down in the body, who men who were out of order. So my thing is this. Biblically, when we look at this, either Paul was confused in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 about women speaking in the church, or he was confused in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I submit to you that Paul wasn't confused at all, that Paul understood for everything there's a season and a time and purpose for everything under the heavens, a time to speak and a time to be quiet. 
That was, that's part of that scripture, uh, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I submit to you that Paul understood that. Further, when we talk about women speaking in the church, and we're going to uh, get into this description right now, because Anna was prophesying she was speaking prophetic oracles of God, and she was a woman, and she was speaking in the temple, and there's no biblical evidence that Anna was rebuked by the Pharisees who had control of the temple at that time because she was a widow, she was a, a, a holy woman, she, she'd been in there for many, many years, and she was viewed as a holy woman. There's no biblical evidence that they tried to shut her down as a woman from speaking. Now, the case can be said, I'm going to slow down here, that if Anna could prophesy the oracles of God and she could speak in the presence of these church or these temple leaders. Why is it different today? But moreover, was Paul really saying that women shouldn't speak at all in the church or women shouldn't prophesy at all? Keep in mind, first Corinthians chapter 11, he was teaching them how to prophesy and pray correctly. If that be true, why were women allowed to speak? in the presence of Jesus, but later Paul's going to say women shouldn't speak in Jesus' church? Yeah. The description, similar to Simeon, Luke 2.25, and remember, uh, remember uh, uh, the baby Jesus brought to the temple and, and Simeon was just blessed because his eyes could behold uh, God's deliverance. Anna is distinguished by her devotion to God and designated as a prophetess, directed by the Holy Spirit of God. She prophesied, directed by the Holy Spirit of God. She is the daughter of Phineal, meaning the face of God, from the tribe of Asher. The tribe of Asher, her ancestral lineage, originally occupied the far northwestern part of Israel's territory. The writer notes that she was married for only seven years, making her a widow of about 84 years at the time of her encounter with the Lord Jesus. The fact that she's continually fasting and praying in the temple with her ancestral homeland being some 75 miles away speaks volume concerning her character. And I'm going to stop that description right there. It speaks volume concerning her character. She was allowed to prophesy the oracles of God in the temple, the, and she was directed by the Holy Spirit of God. John the Baptist was also a prophet, the forerunner of Jesus, who prophesied. We remember his vision of a dove descending on Jesus and a voice from heaven saying, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. Remember that John was a prophet. I'm not saying Anna and John, same office, but different administrations. I'm not saying that they, that Anna was like, was, was, uh, uh, the forerunner like John the Baptist was. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is John the Baptist prophesied and he preached. Anna prophesied as well, directed by the Holy Spirit of God. And what I want to bring out here is her character is what mattered. She was under direction of the Holy Spirit, but her character was unassailable. Why is that important for our lesson today about whether our, our, our women in ministry? That becomes important because some of church, some of you church leaders are more worried about our sister's gender than her character. You were put up and deal with a wayward, out of order man who said God sent him, uh, uh, somebody who's the lifestyle is totally contrary to scripture and they have a character that's in opposition to God. But you want to come down on our sisters who have Holy Ghost characters because they speak and preach and prophesy. But you want to let these men get away with it or you want these men to sit in your pulpit while sisters can't come up there. We're worried more about gender now than character. I'm more worried. Anna was a woman of good character who spoke and prophesied the oracles of God. And she was of good character. What do you think? I said, it. yeah, we, it's going to get tough, brothers. But sisters, I'm coming down your path as well. When it comes to pastor, I'm coming down your way as well. What do you think? How do you react when you finally receive a long-awaited answer to prayer? And what we know, one of the and one of the, the, the chief things, regardless of, of who proclaims it, one of the things that Israel fell short upon it when Jesus came around, that God had answered a prayer that their ancestors had prayed about the coming Mashiach 
or the coming Messiah. And when the Messiah came, it didn't look the way, Jesus didn't look the way that they thought he should look. They were looking for a Davidic king to deliver them from their enemies, which they believed was Roman, when Jesus came to deliver them and us from our ultimate enemy, which is sin. What am I saying? I'm saying when it comes to prophesying and when it comes to God speaking a word, even through our sisters, especially through our sisters, a message may come wrapped in a package that you may not believe God can use, but that is certainly not the truth. I come at you today, saints, as someone who believed and tried to put the biblical case together some years ago against women preaching in the church because that's what I've been told. Now, once I try to put the biblical package together, and I told you one of those packages, this was a long package, this was like a long uh, presentation. Uh, the, I was putting together this, this business case, women not preaching. One thing I ran into was 1 Corinthians chapter 14, what Paul said about women not speaking, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 11 with Paul teaching them. So one thing that I found out and the Lord had to deal with me on is women, and he kept putting women in front of me, now, I ain't saying they pastor me. It ain't what I'm saying. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that. But he kept bringing a word to me through women. For instance, one of the top most, the, one of the top three most powerful rebukes I ever got, into my, got in my life. And this is just a testimony about God speaking through a woman. Women speak out. That's the call. That's the lesson title. Was from my dear sister, Sean DeBerry. And I was praying, I was praying, talking to the Lord. I was excited. Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. Moses wanted to see the face of God. And I remember the scripture that said, the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I also remember the scripture in Psalm 37 said, delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. And I said, Lord, show me your glory. I just said it. And I was waiting, waiting, waiting. And Sean DeBerry came. I'm like, Sean, you know, what's going on here, Sean DeBerry? It's my dear sister in Denver, Colorado. I was like, what's going on? I said, I prayed the Lord this, and he ain't done it yet. And she said, well, she said, uh, Brian, what you have to understand is this. And Shonda Berry was cold with the word. She is probably one of the most top three most skillful people with the word man or women I've ever met, myself included, obviously. Sean said, well, Brian, that's what he had for Moses. That doesn't mean that's what he had for you. Bam! I got delivered. God spoke through a woman. So I said that to before I talk about answers to prayer is... How do you, God answers prayers in a way that's going to benefit his will, not in a way that's going to benefit your will, right? God isn't going to do anything. The next thing I want to say, especially to our sisters, is this. God is, a, God is going to fulfill his word. He's not going to contradict it. OK, that's something we need to understand as well. So if a word, a preach word or teach word comes in a package that you don't agree with, are you going to reject that word? Understanding that in our lesson today, Anna prophesied to men and we're going to learn here pretty quickly. She actually preached at Jerusalem. Anna was preaching and she was prophesying. She was a woman of character. Are you more worried about gender than character? And if I can wrap that up really nicely with a clean bow, are you going to reject the message because you don't like, brothers, the package that it comes in? Also prophesy, and this is the biblical context, but this is that which was in Acts 2, 16 through 21. Now we shifted uh, from Luke, uh, we shifted over from uh, Luke to, to Acts, and this is pretty, Peter, but it but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out on my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, oh my God, servants and on my handmaidens, women, I will pour out in the and I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Remember, handmaids, remember Mary uh, said, and the Lord looked upon his handmaiden, the most humble of his handmaidens. You remember that, right? So, and I shall show wonders in heaven. This is God's word. And signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So when I package those together, these packages of scriptures here, I see that and my servants and I uh, shall see 
the men and women shall prophesy, and and men and women shall prophesy. So whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm going to men and women are going to prophesy, and people are going to come to the Lord and be saved. How can we leave? Sisters, out of that, when the Bible says handmaidens there. So I'm directly now confronting women ain't supposed to be preachers. Now, let's go further into that discussion. I'm going to take a little longer today than I do usually 41, 42 minutes. I'm going to take a little longer today because we've got to deal with this. The next thing I want to challenge, if I believe this scripture, if I believe the things that uh, Anna said, now that we understand that first, uh, first Corinthians chapter 4, uh, uh, 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 11 cannot be in conflict in each other. Now that we understand that Jesus actually, after his resurrection, Jesus sent the message to women. This doesn't even mention the woman at the well. Now that we understand that Anna was not rebuked for prophesying, and now that we understand even Peter preached that uh, 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 men and women uh, were going to prophesy, and now that we understand that whosoever should call the name of the Lord shall be saved, then that same package of scripture means that our sisters as well is going to be prophesied, and people are going to be brought to the Lord. Brothers, why aren't you giving our sisters church leaders? Why aren't those of you who have our sisters and you have confirmed their calling that are ministers and preachers in this church. Now, I'm not speaking about one specific church in this community because one of our churches ain't playing. If you preach, you preach, right? One of our churches ain't playing. But brothers, are you giving our sisters equitable? Remember, remember uh, in our last set of lessons, remember we talked about equity? Are you giving our sisters equitable time? On fourth Sunday, fifth Sunday, when you gone to preach the message, is you giving these men ministers? And if not, why? If these you think these men are ministers, and you said sisters are ministers, and you've confirmed their call, even licensed some of them to preach, are you giving them the opportunity to share God's word, especially in our more traditional churches? And if not, why not? But well, people will get mad. Oh, so it's about what they say. The Bible, brothers, the Bible says, pastors. Till I seek to please men or God, because if I shouldn't, because if I should seek to please men, I shall not be the servant of Christ. How much more of this biblical case do I need to build? I don't believe a woman should be a pastor. We're going to get into that next week. Yeah, because that's a conversation that I'm coming. I'm been coming down our brother's lane or coming down our brother's pew on this lesson. But next next week, I'm coming down our sister's pew as well. What do you think? Do you take advantage of opportunities to share your faith or experience concerning Jesus to those you meet? Why or why not? That's an interesting question. Now, it's interesting that, especially for our sisters, whether you are a preacher or not, I got to say this. The Bible tells us to go into all the world to preach the gospel. This is what the Bible says, baptizing and doing all of these things. That sharing Jesus, out, sharing Jesus inside the walls or outside of the walls are not uh, only it is not only restricted or allowable for men to do that. Now here's the issue, especially with our women not in in some of many of our churches. And I'm going to tell you flat out uh, in, in St. Mark, I, I was very open with them during the interview process. I was very open with St. Mark Baptist Church about where I stood with this because I have been delivered uh, from this. But my thing is, if I ever get a woman who says she, she's God called her and that confirmation is called, I'm gonna put her up. Why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I? Some of us, some of us have put up these men who ain't got nothing to say uh, of these crooked preachers. And, and then our sisters come and, and, and have the spirit of Anna on there. I'm not saying the spirit of Deborah. We're going to talk about that, especially our sisters who use that as a reason to pastor. We're going to talk about that as well. That's false doctrine. There's a difference between a judge, a priest, and a prophet. Well, we're going to talk about that next week, though. So my thing is, I'm going to put her up because we put men up. Even though we know we let them uh, do the altar prayer, we let them sit in the pulpit when 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 we <laughs> when there's a sister that that has the call as well and, and and maybe living a more holy life. We got a reckoning to do in the house of God. King James Version, Acts 21 and more shall prophesy. And the next day. We that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Philip's daughters prophesied. 
So what I find out is you don't have to be an 84-year-old widow who's spending all your time in the temple to prophesy. Now it says, and the same man had four daughters virgin, which did prophesy. Whew, now we got more women speaking the oracles of God. The text picks up after Paul, and this is a description, and his company's one day stay in Palestinema. When Paul reached Caesarea, he entered and stayed in the house of Philip. Philip was now an evangelist. The title indicates the specific focus of Philip's ministry, leading the lost to salvation in Christ. Acts 8.40 reveals that after Philip's fruitful evangelist encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch, he preached throughout the coastal region and ended up settling in Caesarea. As Paul and his team travel, they find Philip still there several years later. He was one of the first seven men set aside as deacons to support the apostles' ministry to the fastest growing church. The record simply states that Philip had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Many scholars suggest, I, I'm not, sorry, I'm going to skip that. I don't care what they suggest. I just care what the word of God says. And we, we've got to be careful with supposition. I've told you that before. We've got false doctrine comes in when there's supposition. And I'm not saying that's true of the lesson. I'm just saying we have to be careful of that. Whatever it may, what it may have been was noteworthy enough to inspire the Bible historian to include their presence in Acts. This account is the last portion of the book of Acts, emphasizing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon those presents as on the day of Pentecost, as predicted by Joel. The account points gently to God's use of all categories of believers in his plan of salvation, saying whom he would, whether Jew or Gentile, and using whomever he would to carry the message. Now, carry the message is relative, especially to what we're going to talk about next week as, as I close here. You can say that God called you to preach. But how did he call you to deliver his message? In what capacity or what office or what gifting did he set you aside for sisters to do that and brothers as well? What do you think? How can we better engage the world for Christ utilizing everyone God has called to anoint? The first thing we need to do is the first, very first thing we need to do to uh, engage the world uh, for the, the the purposes of Christ is to be about uh, be about what Jesus was about, and that is allowing women to be who God called them to be, and even Paul, being Paul, who God who uh, looks like he spoke against women doing this and doing uh, doing that, especially preaching and prophesying and praying, which he did not. Now, we have got to present love for one another. That's how the world is going to know we are Jesus' disciples. And finally, just a quick preview of next week's lesson before I pray. I want uh, all of you um, that hear this message, wherever you hear this message, to tune in next week, uh, whether it's uh, certainly on KBBG 88.1 uh, FM, um, next next uh, Sunday school, I also, or whether you're streaming live around the world, uh, the KBBG's broadcast, uh, whether you you are on our Sunday School Facebook page, uh, I have a Sunday a Facebook page now strictly that is called Sunday School Lesson. You go to Facebook and search Sunday School Lesson, your dear servant's going to pop up. I'm going to put these lessons there weekly as well. But I want you to invite as many uh, of our sisters in ministry as possible uh, to hear that that lesson as well, because uh, one of the struggles that we have uh, as teachers of God's Word is a lot of times we believe God has called us to certain things, but how we explain those callings is biblically inadequate. And with our sisters that serve in the role of shepherds, shepherdesses, apostles, whatever you want to call them, they believe that God has called them to preach and to do this and that. I'll never argue with it, ever. Here's the challenge. All the explanations I've heard from our sisters who I don't go and say, who are you, the pastor? No. A lot of times I sit down with my sisters, they just automatically go into ex trying to explain why they do what they do. One didn't. Bless her. <laughs> Woo she, she just like, hey, Pastor, that was going on? You know, and I understand why that's done because a lot of times sisters feel like they got to defend and justify. But that lesson is going to challenge our sisters to eat and, and on two things to either understand that the only people they only the only being they have to answer to really is God ultimately but second is to be more biblically sound in how they explain if they feel a need to explain 
why they are pastors. Because the Deborah, we've heard about Deborah. That's, and we're talking about women in ministry. here. That's where this is going. And I'm going to keep it real with you. That's, there's a difference between a priest, a prophet, and a judge. That excuse is nonsensical. 1 Timothy chapter 3 also there's a reversing of roles there <laughs> that Genesis chapter that Genesis chapter three disagrees with. And there's so many more examples and we're going to get there. So I want you all to tune in so we can all become strengthened in who God has called us to be, especially for our sisters serving that role uh, that is under persecution and all those things. Uh, we just want to assist you. I want to assist you in better, uh, better confirming or rethinking what you believe the strategy is that God wants you to use in order to spread his message. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for the gathering today. Father, I, I ask that you strengthen every one of us, Lord, especially our sisters, uh, Lord, who are often under persecution, whom you set aside to prophesy and to preach. Lord, I ask that you give them, uh, Lord, continue to give them anointing they need to stand in a dying world. Lord, I ask you to convict the hearts of those church leaders, Father, who have unfairly and unbiblically uh, Lord, set our sisters aside, Lord, in favor of certainly less anointed and less qualified men. Father God, I ask you today in the name of Jesus, Lord, that this uh, study lessons, Lord, these lessons bind us together, Lord, and that as your word says, this is an iron sharpening iron session. And Lord, that all of us, Lord, uh, can be convicted, Lord, and, and encourage our brothers and our sisters to live out the call wherewith they are called. In Jesus' name, amen. And so be it.